applications and uh, in many region and many countries in Gulf uh, region. So today we are going to have uh, two sessions with our two speakers. And the first speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, Kunderson, who is a facilitator at Unitor. Uh, he's based in London now, and he will tell you more about uh, Jordan and Oman monarchies, also about their cultural and uh, what else? Uh, cultural legitimacy. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Gunderson, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, I'm also here. I'm just taking off my microphone. My microphone. Perfect. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, thank you for hosting me. Uh, so, I do today want to talk about two monarchies in the Middle East, one in the Gulf, another in the Levant, and discuss how these monarchies are centralized. Uh, how their politics is run and uh, how this affects uh, aspects of nationalism and the concept of nationalism. So uh, here you should be able to see to the left we have the previous Sultan of Oman called Qabus. He passed in January 2020 and it's interesting that in this poster here which is for the National Day celebrations uh, he is wearing to the left a military uniform to emphasize the notion of security and his status as commander of the armed forces. And to the right, he's wearing a turban, more traditional clothing uh, that we have in Oman to also emphasize traditionalism. Uh, to the right, you might be able to make out King Abdullah of Jordan. Um, the photo is a bit faded there, but he is the ruler currently of Jordan since 1999. So I will talk a bit about him as well and how he rules his country. So uh, I have visited Oman and I've also lived in Jordan for four years. Um, very interesting kingdoms, very interesting cultures. And so we will discuss nationalism through resistance at first in both countries. So we have the Ottoman Rebellion in Jordan and we had a civil war in Oman. I will also discuss how war and religion built what I would call political legitimacy in both countries and how that legitimacy continues through welfare and patronage, what we call the ruling bargain or the ability to provide welfare to citizens in exchange for them recognizing your rule. I will then also look at the Arab Spring and we're going to analyze a couple of speeches that were given by these leaderships in response to the Arab Spring. So firstly, I think one of the interesting things to note about both countries is their locations. So if we look at Jordan firstly, you should be able to see from this uh, lovely map that Jordan is bordered by a variety of states. We have Saudi Arabia, the largest Gulf state bordering Jordan. We also have Iraq, which is not stable, and Syria, of course. And I'm sure you've all heard about the influx of refugees coming in from Syria uh, to Jordan. Jordan as a country is also surrounded by Republicans. And this is a very important point because in Jordan's history, they have gone through periods of Arab nationalism in which Republicans uh, in Egypt, for example, attacked the concept of a kingdom or of a monarchy, claiming that it was backwards, it was outdated. Uh, Oman, for its uh, own issues, it also borders Saudi Arabia and it borders the Republic of Yemen. Um, and this is a point which is interesting because Yemen is a country that has also gone through unrest, that is a republic, and that has also funded uh, warfare during Oman's civil war, which I will discuss as part of this presentation. One of the differences, of course, between Oman and Jordan is that Oman has oil, I believe about 4.8 billion barrels worth of oil. Jordan doesn't have that. And this gives Oman a bit more wiggle room, a bit more ability to uh, ensure there is less unemployment, for example, and to be able to uh, buy off uh, peace, if you like. So during the Arab Spring, both kingdoms experienced different pressure points, but I wanted to look at them because they are both monarchies. And when the Arab Spring happened, there was the impression that somehow monarchies fared better than Republicans did and that monarchies could draw on traditionalism and perhaps religion in a way that uh, Mubarak of Egypt or President Ben Ali of Tunisia could not. So when we look at both of these countries, Jordan is to an extent a constitutional monarchy, whereas Oman is an absolute monarchy. It's a highly centralized monarchy uh, under the previous Sultan who established himself in 1970. 
Uh, also, Oman as a country has been around officially since 1821, whereas Jordan was established in 1921 as a kind of a British protectorate with independence granted in 1946. Now, Jordan's nationalism was built to an extent on defeating the Ottomans. So at the end of the First World War, the Ottoman Empire was fragmenting and uh, Sharif Hussein, who is a Hashemite, he's a, a, if you like, the first Hashemite ruler of Jordan. He led Arabs to independence, to break away from the Ottoman Empire. Um, whereas in Oman, we had a civil war that was more from 1970 to 1975, which was also built on rival claims of rule, which I will discuss as well. Both countries have strong links to Britain. Uh, both rulers have attended Sandhurst Military Academy here in England, uh, but they also have links to the United States. Uh, when we look at Jordan, it wasn't until 1949 that it became the Hashemite Kingdom. Now, this is important because it means that the ruling family has added their name to the country. So the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, ruled by the Hashemites. Uh, there are very few countries that have that apart from Saudi Arabia. It's one of the only countries in the world that has the ruling family's name as part of the country. Uh, Qabus, the previous Sultan, ruled for half a century, that's a long time, 50 years of rule, half a century of rule in Oman. Uh, in that period, from 52 to 1999, and then up to the present, Jordan has had two kings. Oman, from 1970 up until the present, has only had now a Sultan who took over in January 2020 after Qabus, because Qabus died of old age. So if we look a bit at how Jordan was birthed. As I mentioned, at the end of the First World War, a lot of Arabs who were subjects of the Ottoman Empire began to rediscover their cultures and started to resist Ottoman rule. This led to what is known as the Great Arab Revolt, led by Sharif Hussein. And the result of that successful revolt was that he gained respect and followers. So suddenly he was able to build a kingdom that in his mind would be a pan-Arabia project. In his mind, he wanted his family to rule in Iraq, in uh, the Hejaz, which is now part of Saudi Arabia, and what became Transjordan. So this was really a large project to replace Ottoman rule with Arabian rule over this part of the Middle East. Now, Transjordan is an interesting name because this was the name of Jordan around 1921, and the term in English, trans, implies that you are going through like a transit for example if you have a transit flight it's not your final destination so trans jordan implies that jordan is part of something bigger and again it links to the idea that sharif hussein wanted jordan to be part of a greater arabia which would also consist of iraq and syria um, in 1923 the Emirate of Transjordan was recognized under Emir Abdullah the first, but it was a very, how should I put this? It was an Emirate that still had British protection, uh, administrative assistance from Jerusalem uh, by the British. Stamps came in from Palestine and the values of those stamps were handwritten. So it was obvious that things were not fully set up in part because Emir Abdullah the first did not see Jordan as permanent. He saw it as, in a sense, transitional, leading something bigger. Here we have a photo of him from one of my articles. To the left is the Emir. To the right, we have a man called John Glubb, who's British. Uh, now, he came in to train the army in Jordan as they started to build up their own regime security, their own forces. And he stayed until uh, the time of King Hussein, which is after 1950. What happened there was he was dismissed because they had differing views, but also from the 50s onwards, uh, monarchies in the Arab world saw a period of unrest in which a lot of Republicans, Arab Republicans, accused these monarchies of being British puppets. So having a British advisor for your military was seen as a bad image. Now this is a photo of uh, myself when I was living in Jordan uh, back in the day. Um, and I'm standing here next to a Bedouin guard. This is by, uh, in, in Jordan's capital, Amman, the ruins of the Roman theater. And they employ in the public sector various Jordanians. Uh, he's wearing here a typical uniform. And I add this photo because one of the first things that Jordan needed was a form of security. At this time, starting in 1921, uh, there were a lot of separate tribes that spanned all of Arabia. And they would not necessarily recognize a centralized authority such as a king. So the first thing that happened was that the 
monarchy had to organize the tribes. And here we have the start of what we call what we call the ruling bargain. So um, the tribes agreed to work together to protect the monarchy. Um, and they did this because they recognized that number one, the Hashemite family had lineage to the Prophet Muhammad. They're all Muslims, so they respected that. And secondly, they were given socioeconomic privileges in exchange for loyalty. So for example, land, assets, uh, and whatnot. Uh, it, it was very transactional. So the idea that you support the monarchy and will protect the monarchy, partly out of a sense of honor, but also because you are gaining material benefits for doing so. Now, another aspect to Jordan is to understand because of how the country was created, what does it mean to be Jordanian? And how does that feed into modern conflict? And here we're going to talk a bit about uh, the West Bank and also Jordan's wars with Israel. Uh, here, this is a photo of King Hussein uh, in 1967 announcing that he lost the West Bank. So the West Bank was originally a part of Jordan. Uh, when King Hussein was pressured into going to war against Israel by Egypt's president, uh, he ended up losing the West Bank. And this led to uh, an influx of Palestinians coming into Jordan, which also fed into Jordan's nationalism being divisive. So firstly, the loss of the West Bank from 1948 onwards, we did have Palestinians coming into Jordan, but after the loss of the West Bank, there was a greater influx. Um, this meant that Palestinians who came in, they were not Jordanian, but they were granted citizenship. Uh, the difference of course, is that although they were seen as citizens, they did not have the same material benefits as Jordanians. So they have the passport, but they don't have the same rights as uh, Jordanians do. Also, the loss of the West Bank meant losing East Jerusalem and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is a major uh, Muslim landmark that the Hashemites had guarded, if you like. And of course, by losing the West Bank, that affected their ability to draw on religion because they lost the physical ability to protect this mosque. Uh, enough Palestinians coming into Jordan led to the question of whether or not Jordan would become a replacement for Palestine. And at times the kingdom is played along with this and at other times they have resisted uh, for a variety of reasons, but it also you know, feeds into to what extent are you Jordanian if you are Palestinian. We saw after 67 that you also had militias who started operating in Jordan. Um, they tried to use Jordan as a launching base uh, for attacks against Israel and also against even King Hussein himself. So we actually had a situation where you have Jordanians, you have Palestinians with Jordanian citizenship, and then you have militias who ran their own camps. Uh, they ran education, welfare, to the point that they became a state within a state. And that's a problem because if you have that, of course you have a, a political actor who can threaten your monarchy and threaten your legitimacy. This is why we have what I call fragmented nationalism in Jordan. So on the one hand, we have those who are from the East Bank, those who were born in Jordan from the Bedouin tribes who are considered Jordanian by birth. And because of that, they support the monarchy in exchange for limited privileges, public sector employment, educational grants, um, and you know, sort of financial support, and they can also serve in political positions. Those who are from the West Bank were not given this privilege. They had Jordanian citizenship, but they don't really have any privileges. Um, after an assassination attempt by a Palestinian militia on King Hussein, he expelled them from the public sector. So you couldn't, you know, for example, as a Palestinian, you can't really be a prime minister. You can't serve in influential positions in the government. And so in Jordan, we see that the private sector is dominated by Palestinians. Uh, here's a, a small photo of a jewelers, for example, uh, in, in the capital. And they are a very successful jeweler, Sakishha. They're across the whole kingdom and they are Palestinian. So all the major companies we have in Jordan that are successful are Palestinian because they had to enter the private sector uh, in order to survive. Now, when we go from Jordan to Oman and we look at uh, Oman's own nationalism, I've said here from communism to absolutism, uh, one of the differences I found between Oman and Jordan in my travels is that there are a lot more portraits of the Sultan uh, as a military leader. In Jordan, uh, there was a bit less of that. When I worked in Jordan, by the way, I worked for an NGO in Jordan. Uh, in my office, we have a photo of the King of Jordan, you know, 
so you enter the office and every day there's a portrait of the king, but it was a photograph. It was not painted. Here we have a lot more painted portraits of the Sultan. Um, and as I said, in military uniform, emphasizing, I think, uh, how he tried to build himself as the father of modern Oman and as the father of uh, the nation, someone who ended a civil war. So to understand Oman's nationalism and how we came to have this nation, we need to go back a little bit. Uh, the previous Sultan Qaboos, who ruled from 1970 to 2020, his father, Sultan Sayyid bin Taimur, was a very solitary ruler. And this is where we see problems in Oman happening. Under his rule, Oman was basically split into two parts, the coast and the interior. And it was even called the Sultanate of Muscat and Oman, as if you have two different countries here. Under his rule, the country was isolated. Ships were not allowed to anchor. Um, there were no tourists allowed to the point where for anyone who wanted to come into the country, there's a rumor that the Sultan he even looked through the application himself and he stamped it with a yes or a no personally. Um, so there was a lot of isolation during his time. As uh, this continued, a rebellion began to grow against his rule and against what people saw as irrational restrictions. And when Kabus himself returned from education in Sandhurst, he was uh, put under house arrest. And this is interesting because uh, Kabus was educated in Europe, in England, and served in armed forces uh, in Germany and other parts of Europe. So then when he returns home, suddenly he's under house arrest. And the reason for that is because his father was worried that he would, uh, that his son, Qabus, would overthrow him. And as it turns out, this is what happened. Uh, also at this time, Oman was starting to explore for oil. And this is also an important reason why we had war, because as I said, there were two sections of Oman, the coast and the interior. Within the interior, there were religious groups who believed that others should have a right to rule a separate country called an imamate. So we have someone like Ghalib al Hinai, who was an individual who led the rebellion or parts of it against Sultan Said bin Taimur, because he believed he had more religious legitimacy. When oil was then discovered in the interior, of course, it gave uh, it gave him and others even more of a reason to fight their rebellion and split away from the Sultan and it gave the Sultan more reason to prevent that from happening because they wanted access to oil. So with Qabus himself, this is a photo that I took while I was in Muscat at the Armed Forces Museum. And it's important that this museum exists because in a sense, this museum stands as a symbol of how the military can be used, not just to fight wars, but to create a new country. So in this photo, uh, Kabus is about 29 years old. Uh, he's just you know, gained power and he is inspecting troops. So at the age of 29, on the 23rd of July, 1970, he overthrew his father. And at that time, the British were involved. In fact, uh, Kabus himself had a colleague or a classmate called Timothy Landon, a Brit at Sandhurst, who acted as his advisor and who helped him organize the coup and ensure that officers would remain loyal to him. Now, when the coup first happened, the involvement of the Brits was downplayed heavily. Why? Because at the time, Kabus and even Britain agreed that they wanted it to be seen as a domestic internal affair. They did not want to create the image of a new monarch who was a British puppet. So one of the first things they did after they overthrew Kabus's father was that the Sultan's armed forces, they began to step up attacks in the south to end the rebellion, but they also began a hearts and minds campaign. And this is important because what it meant is that uh, Qabus wanted to say the armed forces are not going to be a force just for war. They will also be a force for social change and to help our people. So here we have a poster in Arabic, um, which says the hand of God crushes communism. And so again, what, what Qabus did is he tried to use uh, religion as a, a, a sort of a rallying banner. Uh, Oman is a conservative culture. It's uh, what's called Ibadi Islam. And religion is a central part of daily life. So at some point as the rebellion against the previous Sultan continued, uh, communist states began to fund that rebellion, especially China and Yemen. So the new Sultan, he said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to emphasize that we're Muslim. And therefore those who are not Muslim, i.e. communist, are, are, are not, they are not Islamic. They are not part of our, our culture. And so it became shameful to be associated with communism. 
The Sultan himself then also granted amnesty to fighters, which was a very smart move. Um, he remembered that by taking over and lifting restrictions that his father had put in place, and then offering amnesty to any fighter who lays down their arms, a lot of rebels would stop the war, and they did. They definitely did. Uh, a nice little side note, uh, the word Sultan is Arabic, of course, and it comes from the Arabic word Sulta. Sulta means power or authority. So from that, we get the word Sultan, which of course is uh, a religious, but also a political status. Now, how did Qabus himself fund the building of the nation? Oil. And this is another interesting point because what uh, his predecessor did, what Taimur did was that he allowed uh, oil companies to come in to explore for oil, but he charged them for the privilege. And one of the things that he did, perhaps one of the few good things he did was that he played companies off against each other to increase the bid. So in reality, there was actually oil flow since the late sixties under his rule, when Kabul came onto the scene and overthrew his father, what he did was he took credit for modernizing the nation through oil. Uh, and also in the seventies, we had an oil boom. Now, one of the problems is that although a lot of money was flowing into the country, up to 50% of the oil profits were going towards the war. So the war had to end. And it lasted from effectively uh, under Kabul's time from 1970 to 1975. Once the amnesty was granted and people stopped fighting, more of the oil money could be focused on welfare. And under this circumstance, again, Kabul ensured that the armed forces were deployed to build schools, hospitals, and to greet people. Uh, he wanted to show that the armed forces were a face for good. Uh, here we have a photo of the oil and gas museum, uh, which I visited when I was in Muscat. So again, the fact that we have an oil and gas museum shows how important oil has been to this country. Uh, at this time, in the 70s, Kabus also announced that he wanted to change the name of Oman from Oman and Muscat to just Oman, to emphasize unity, that we're not sort of part of the coast, part of the interior, we are all Omani, we are one country. And one of the things he also did, which was very smart, is that throughout his rule, he had a Meet the People tour up until I think his, his health started to fail him. So every year, he would travel across the country to meet people, to listen to their concerns. And this was important because it shows that he was not his father. His father lived in isolation in the south and stayed in his palace and didn't listen to the people. So he wanted to emphasize, I will not do that. I will listen to you. Now, if one to try to understand the, what we call the ruling bargain, so the idea that you receive material benefits in exchange for not having political rights, uh, Oman and Jordan are very different. Oman's welfare is funded through oil profits, whereas in Jordan, there is no oil. And instead, they rely on international, uh, especially US aid, which means that they have limited welfare available. Um, public sector jobs and education for Omanis is, is free. Uh, of course, in Jordan, if you are an East Bank Jordanian, then yes, you may have land assets, you will get a free education, uh, but not if you're Palestinian. Uh, when I traveled to Oman, I found it interesting that there are a lot of, uh, in the private sector, there are a lot of uh, Pakistanis and South Asians who have grown up in Oman, and they are part of the, the business class, if you like, or the business elite. Uh, so the private sector is dominated by them, uh, whereas in Jordan, it's mainly Palestinians, as we've discussed. Of course, thanks to oil, wages in Oman can be bolstered by Social Security. If you are not employed, you may receive some sort of benefit. But in Jordan, this is only for public sector employees. And we see here some of the key differences uh, when it comes to subsidies. Although Oman has limited oil, they have subsidies on electricity, water, and food. That might change soon, but nonetheless, it's a key point because in Jordan, a lot of the protests have been because they can't afford subsidies. So when gas prices or food prices have increased, this is often when we have seen people taking to the streets. In addition, uh, I do want to mention the parliamentary system in Oman. Now, Oman is a country that has various tribes. And the, the Sultan, Sultan Qaboos, he recognized this when he was going to take power. He said, okay, we're going to have a nationalism that recognizes the tribes. So in, in this kind of society, you would have uh, different communities and they would have uh, a head, if you like. So a member, you know, as a community member, you come to your leader with your concerns. So Qaboos said, okay, in our parliament, we're going to have, I will act as the, the head of the nation and the head of the parliament. Uh, the tribes in question, 
their people will go to their tribal leaders with their concerns and the tribal leaders will come to me. And this is how we will have consultation and a debate. In Jordan, we have a multi-party parliamentary system, but a constitutional monarchy. And one of the things that has allowed, especially during the Arab Spring, is that it has allowed the monarchy to push responsibility onto the parties that were elected and to be able to say, well, you know, rising food prices and whatnot isn't the monarchy's fault. It means that the parties that were elected are not doing their jobs. So firstly here with the Arab Spring, I have two photos. One of them is from Jordan. One of them is from Oman. Uh, I don't know if you can guess which is which, but uh, the photo to the left, which has more crowds, is from Jordan. The photo to the right, where you see crowds are more spaced out, they're protesting, but you can see it's not as crowded. This is from Oman. And again, this is one of the key differences that oil has allowed Oman to have a softer response to the Arab Spring or to not see as many protests. They have had protests, but it was not as harsh as in Jordan. Uh, this is what oil has allowed. And in fact, I should add that during the Arab Spring in Jordan, there was a, a, a vocal minority who chanted against the king, whereas in Oman, most of the protesters actually supported the Sultan. They even held up posters with his photo and said, we support the Sultan, but we need things to change. And we believe that the Sultan is not the problem. It is his advisors who have misled him. So here in Jordan's Arab Spring, uh, in roughly January 2011, we saw protests over unemployment and rising food prices. And in November 2012, we saw clashes with security. Now, I arrived in Jordan for my first job in November 2012. And when I first came, I didn't see a lot of protests. Uh, I was told to not go to the downtown area on Fridays because after Friday prayers, there would sometimes be protests. And I lived in three or four different neighborhoods during my time in Jordan. I did not see a lot of protests uh, up until about 2013. One day I was coming uh, coming home from, from work and we, we drove past a, a, a government building, I think it was the Ministry for Finance, and there were people there protesting quite vocally. And uh, the person who was driving us said, you know, uh, the difference between 2013 versus 2011 is now on top of unemployment, we have refugees coming in from Syria. and. There were a lot of Jordanians who felt that if they had semi-skilled or unskilled labor, Syrians who came in were willing to work for less. And this was causing, you know, further unemployment. And so people were worried about their jobs. So really at the heart of protests, it was fairly socioeconomic. Now, one of the things I've done in my research projects is I have tried to analyze when monarchies are faced with the Arab Spring, can they defend themselves? Can they answer back? Can they defend their form of rule? So when King Abdullah gave a speech after protests had started. He began to say, "Yo, my brothers and sisters, I want to have a sincere talk with you all about our reform roadmap and what we've achieved. Uh, I have a responsibility under our constitutional monarchy system to be committed to all outcomes. Um, and I also cherish being a descendant of our forefather, the Prophet Muhammad. He then went on to talk about opposition. And he said, negative opposition is not the same as positive opposition. So he said, positive opposition are those who say we want reform and we want to work within the system. Negative opposition are those who wish to overthrow me. And those individuals are inciting fitna or chaos, which I'll discuss in a second. So what did the monarchy mean with this response? He uses the term my brothers and sisters, which it implies equality. Uh, this is important because a lot of Republicans, when they came under pressure, they talked to uh, their people in a very patronizing manner. For example, Egypt's Mubarak, he called Egyptians his children. He said, I want to hold a father's dialogue with my sons and daughters. And then he was overthrown. So a lot of leaders would be careful with the language they use when they give speeches. So we see here the use of some equality. But as the king, he also drew on his religious background and said, you know, look, I am a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Therefore, if you go against me, you are not a good Muslim. And he also went further and he used another Islamic concept called fitna, which I'll briefly explain. This means that there is the notion in Islam that uh, a Muslim country must be ruled by a Muslim ruler, uh, even if they are not fully democratic, because without a Muslim ruler, that a religious community will plunge into chaos. So he was arguing that, if you, again, if you go against me, you will create chaos and the Hashemite monarchy is also drawn on the chaos around them, Syria and Iraq to say, look, you know, if you overthrow the monarchy, we will end up like Iraq, we will end up like Syria. 
Now, in reality, in 2013, uh, elections, which was another issue that the monarchy tackled, had a low turnout, 56%. As part of his speech, uh, the king was able to emphasize, you know, I agree that we need change. I understand that the Arab Spring is a wake-up wake up call. What can you do for that change? You can go and you can vote. Now, my NGO, which I was working for, one of the first projects we worked on was we actually attended a, a press conference after the first votes had come in. And at this press conference, we had observer status. The UN was there as well to uh, ask questions about the whole voting process. And so the Prime Minister of Jordan at the time, Abdullah Ansour, he came to the conference. His finger was, was black with ink to show he'd voted. Uh, and he answered a variety of questions about how the voting process had gone. And also the head of security came for uh, to answer questions about security concerns, if there had been any issues. So things seemed fairly transparent. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot of critics argued that uh, people voted along the same lines of tribes and also along the same lines of royalists versus non-royalists, that the monarchy was able to draw on their allies and also sow fear of uh, chaos, the fear of unrest if they were overthrown, to ensure that elections were kind of more in their favor. Um, I remember when we were at the press conference, uh, one of the uh, members of the press asked the chief of police, had there be, been any security incidents? And again, it shows that they want to emphasize that there is transparency, that the voter turnout is fine, that there's no issues. So at the time, the chief of police said that they had no security incidents except the wife of one political candidate had beaten up the wife of another political candidate and they were both hospitalized. So <laughs> that was the only security incident that occurred, uh, which is, I thought that was kind of, uh, kind of funny. Now, again, looking at Jordan's um, position on the map, we see here that we have Iraq and Syria, and this is what the country is drawn on. This is how the, the Hashemite monarchy has stayed in power. One of the issues that they've dealt with is the refugees and trying to create a fear of unrest. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but when we had the first two Gulf Wars, a lot of refugees came in from Iraq, and a lot of them were business owners, entrepreneurs, and they started businesses in Jordan um, they were, some of them were, were wealthy and they bought up a lot of property in Amman to the point where they permanently drove up property prices. So, you know, it was interesting when they came in that they, I remember speaking to, to, to uh, Iraqis, some of whom had portraits of Saddam Hussein in their shops because they saw that period as a period of stability, if not democracy, uh, and, and a period where they could be in Iraq and there were no problems. Uh, from 2011 onwards, of course, we had Syrian refugees who came into Jordan, and I believe Jordan has absorbed quite a lot of refugees, over a million by 2015. Um, and Abdullah himself said in 2016 during a CNN interview, he said, look, we're, we're reaching breaking point uh, and no other country is really helping us. Europe certainly isn't helping. Uh, again, the issue of access to aid can explain some of the reasons why Jordan is absorbing refugees, that yes, I do believe that many Jordanians want to help out, but also for the monarchy to survive, they need access to aid. And one of the ways they do this is by allowing, for example, more refugees to come into the country, uh, by acting as a broker for various treaties as well. And recently, as you may have heard, under the normalization deal between Israel and the UAE, Jordan may feel under threat because if Israel can talk to other Arab states, why do they need to, talk, to go through Jordan anymore? And that could mean that Jordan is not able to access Washington in the same way as they used to because they signed a peace treaty with Israel in 1994, and that could affect their aid as well. If we look at Oman's Arab Spring, I think it's worth mentioning that in Oman there, there was an Arab Spring, there were protests, there were injuries and deaths in some cases. Uh, in February 20, 2011, we saw protests in Muscat, the capital, and Sohad, which is a port city for jobs, but also political reform. And this is important because it shows that it was both politics and socio-economics. The difference, of course, is that Kabuz could respond in a way that perhaps Abdullah of Jordan could not. So one of the first things he did was he addressed the economic issue by providing $400 a month in benefits. He also promised to create 50,000 jobs overnight. On the political front, however, I found it interesting that he expanded uh, a university named after him, Sultan Kabul's University. He expanded the politics department uh, and his argument was, I want our youth, Omani youth, to be leaders of tomorrow. So I want to ensure that they receive a political education so that they can also contribute to tackling the Arab Spring and to contribute to, to fixing the nation, if you like. One of the key issues he did not address 
was the fact that, you know, as a monarch who had been around for almost 50 years now and who seized power in 1970, a lot of his ministers, high-ranking officials, he kept them since 1970. So from 1970 to 2011, the same faces. And a lot of Omani youth, they didn't like that. They said, look, this has to change because the, the Sultan is the Sultan fine, but his cabinet and the people advising him have been around for decades now. And how can they connect with Omani youth? They're not of our generation. Personally, I think that he chose to keep these people on because he trusted them. This is a sultan who overthrew his father and he then centralized a lot of positions. There are very few monarchies that are centralized as the one in Oman. The sultan is the defense minister, the finance minister, prime minister, you know, uh, and of course the head of state. So I feel that he did not want to give up these portfolios because he worried about losing his power and also worried about threats to his power. This is also why he kept people who he trusted from 1970 because he was worried about who else he could trust. Now, I'm not going to read out this whole speech, but the, the reaction that the monarchy provided emphasized what they had already done through oil. So the monarchy, Sultan Qaboos, said, okay, listen, you know, I know that the youth needs help. They are, the youth are our future. We have already done the following. We've already, uh, since 1970, invested in them. We've provided education, training qualification. We've also provided employment, uh, and we will continue to do that to the best of our ability. But he then mentioned something interesting, and this goes for the whole of the Gulf. He said, we are looking forward to a greater role to be played by the private sector. Now, this is important because one of the main issues we have in the Gulf now, when it comes to reform and also diversifying away from oil, is the fact that the private sector needs to step up and create employment because the government cannot afford to just keep employing people on bloated salaries. In Oman and in other countries, this is an issue that has not been addressed yet. It keeps being put off, and most private sectors in the Gulf are funded directly or indirectly by the government, and they do not sort of you know perform uh, as well as they can. So it's going to take some time for the private sector to step up. But I think that his message to the private sector was: from now on, we need to increase our robustness in the private sector because we need to prepare for a time without oil. Uh, I will also discuss succession because uh, it's, it's very hard to discuss both monarchies without talking about who's next in line. So to the left here, we have the new Sultan of Oman since January 2020, Haitham bin Tariq, who was chosen and he's in his 60s. Uh, of course, you know, when Kabul's died in January, this new Sultan has got to deal with uh, dwindling oil reserves, a possible resurgence of the Arab Spring and coronavirus. Let's not forget that. It's not an easy position to be in. To the right here, we have um, King Abdullah II with his son, King, uh, Crown Prince Hussein. Now, it's interesting that Crown Prince Hussein in this photo has a mustache because uh, there are rumors he's trying to look like his grandfather. Why? Because the Crown Prince of Jordan is half Palestinian. And people still remember his grandfather as the father of modern Jordan who also prevented civil war. So the idea is that he's trying to look like his grandfather to draw on legitimacy. So in Jordan itself, King Hussein, who I consider to be the father of modern Jordan, uh, he inherited his position uh, effectively from, from, you know, from a relative. And he chose his brother to be the crown prince from 1965 to 1999. His brother Hassan was the crown prince. So people knew what to expect that if King Hussein were to die in an accident, God forbid, there would be someone to take over immediately. Um, in 1999, he chose his son Abdullah to become the king, and apparently it was a last-minute decision. Uh, and what happened, according to the king himself, uh, he was called into his father's uh, room when his father was dying, and he was told, You're, I will make you king. To which Abdullah replied, I don't want to be king. And Hussein said, this is why I'm choosing you. So he was implying that he's choosing his son because his son does not want to be king. He doesn't have the ambition, which means he will do a good job. If you want the power, you're not going to look after the people. That was the argument. Um, now, in 2004, Hassan was removed by Abdullah as crown prince so that his own son could take over. So in 2009, at the age of 15, Abdullah's son was designated crown prince and I remember reading an interview in Atlantic magazine in which Abdullah said that you know he said my son hated me for doing this he was he was so angry with me for doing this and he said because once you are chosen to be crown prince you are in the public spotlight you cannot have an ordinary life 
and he said that you know himself because he was chosen last minute it meant that he could have an ordinary life to the extent that a royal family member can have an ordinary life uh he was able to serve in the military he worked his way up the ranks and he did not think he would be king so he had a fairly normal life and that was it with his son because he was designated at a young age it gives the population of jordan certainty but it means that his son from a very young age is going to take on responsibilities uh, i think that at the age of 16 or 17 he chaired a un meeting when his father couldn't make it so he's you know, being given more and more responsibilities and being groomed as the one who will take over now in oman contrary to jordan's lineage and succession Qaboos overthrew his father in 1970, as we've mentioned, and ruled for effectively half a century. That's a very long time for one person to rule. Uh, under his time, he, you know, he had no sons or daughters, uh, Qaboos. And so what he did was he designated someone to take his place and he sealed the name in an envelope. He did not want to announce who this person was during his lifetime, apparently because he feared that that person could build their own power center and perhaps overthrow him. So he didn't want to mention who that was. Uh, when he died, uh, the royal council got together and by law, according to the Sultan's own constitution, they have the right to debate for up to three days and choose whoever they want from the royal family. If they cannot agree, they will then open the envelope and choose whoever Kabus has written. Now, it was interesting that they did not bother doing that. They went straight for the envelope. Uh, this tells me that they wanted to emphasize that Oman remains united, uh, that it is a country where the death of Sultan Qaboos will not affect its stability. So they opened the envelope to respect his decision. And Haytham bin Tariq himself, the difference is between him and Qaboos is that Haytham bin Tariq has sons and daughters, so there will, there will be a crown prince. I will also discuss uh, Iran and Israel uh, briefly to talk about so what is it like for Jordan and Israel and Oman and Israel? Again, going back to the um, normalization deal between Jordan, uh, sorry, between Israel and the UAE, uh, Jordan itself has felt under threat because in 94, they signed a peace treaty so that Israel would lobby Washington on their behalf and give them more aid. Now with uh, the deal with the UAE and Israel, they are worried about their position being threatened. When Israel and UA the UAE announced their normalization, uh, Jordan, some members of the royal family actually uh, were quite cold towards what was going on. They said, well, we don't accept this unless uh, Israel is willing to work on a two-state solution. However, they then turned around and they arrested a cartoonist who uh, made fun of the UAE deal, which shows that they are not going to take things too far. They know that if they want to continue gaining aid, they now have to not only talk to Washington, but also they may have to please the UAE and accept the UAE's position. And when it comes to Iran, of course, uh, a country we all have heard of and all know, um, during the Pahlavi dynasty, which is before 1979, uh, Jordan and Iran got along quite well. Um, but after 1979, Jordan and Iran did not get along at all. Jordan assisted Iraq in Iraq's war with Iran, which lasted for eight years, from 1980 to 1988. And they did that for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the things that Jordan got under Saddam Hussein's Iraq was that they got heavily discounted oil so that uh, Saddam Hussein would sell oil to Jordan at up to a 50% or more discount to give them a break. And Jordanians could come to Iraq without a visa and they could find employment, they could search for work without having to have a visa. That's no longer the case. Uh, so there were benefits to having that relationship with Iraq, but it led to tension with Iran. Also, uh, Abdullah himself has given a speech, I believe it was in 2014, in which he spoke of the Shia crescent. So the idea that most of the monarchies in the Arab world are Sunni Muslim, and that countries like Iran, which are Shia, are threatening to export their revolution abroad and to interfere with others. To what extent this is actually true is, is another matter. Um, but nonetheless, it is a line that a lot of the monarchies seem to toe. And in fact, uh, Jordan was invited to join the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is the uh, a security pact or security forum of the Gulf monarchies. They are not, Jordan is not in the Gulf, but they were invited to join probably because they think alike and also because they were seen as a fellow monarch. Now Jordan refused, and I suspect the reason they did so is because they were saying to themselves, if we join the GCC, there will be benefits such as financial aid, but there will also be trade-offs. 
Um, there, there's going to be aid with strings attached, and Jordan has tried to remain as independent as possible. Uh, this has been increasingly difficult when Gulf countries have provided aid to Jordan, uh, billions in some cases, and may or may not renew that aid if Jordan doesn't toe a certain line. Now for Oman, they have not had any formal relations with Israel, but in 2018, Sultan Qaboos hosted uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who came and visited the capital. This is one of the first times we've had such a, a publicized uh, trip. And it also shows that things are shifting in the Gulf. They responded very cautiously to the UAE deal with, uh, with Israel. And uh, there was a minister who said that this deal will be good for the security of the region. And this is important because really this deal is about security for the Gulf. It is about seeing Israel as a security partner against Iran. Uh, one of the key differences between Oman and Jordan is that they've had good relations with Iran. Uh, under the Shah, uh, troops from Iran were sent to Oman to help in the civil war in 1970. And we also see that after the overthrow of the Shah, Oman continued to be cordial towards Iran. Uh, and it is for that reason, that neutrality, that uh, they became a broker for the uh, JCPOA, the nuclear agreement, which is now falling apart. Uh, Washington could speak to Tehran via Muscat. And so they, they they maintained a certain neutrality to try to ensure that they could have access to as many nations as possible and act as a facilitator. They are also, of course, a member of the Gulf Cooperation Council as well. So to conclude, uh, of course, we'll have a Q&A, but uh, Jordan and Oman are traditional monarchies um, in their respective cultures. I think that we can see how really the ability to counter the Arab Spring if it's socioeconomic protests, what we're talking about is the ability to buy people off. And for that, you need oil. Uh, both countries have had certain conflict, which has influenced their nationalism, and they've both drawn a religion. But I think that this has been a bigger issue in Jordan, where the ruling family can trace their lineage to the Prophet Muhammad and can draw on that during times of crisis. Again, limited welfare is an issue in Jordan compared to Oman, but they both have geostrategic locations. Jordan is, is close to Israel, Palestine, Iraq, and Syria, and they draw on that. They try to act as mediators in their region. They try to draw on the fear of unrest um, and the fear of chaos to gain more aid and to stop protests. And again, both Oman and Jordan have tried to be fairly neutral monarchies that can be seen as facilitators in the region. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Yeah, guys, uh, you are free to ask questions using your uh, microphone or writing to your chat. And Mr. Gunderson, thank you for your presentation first. Uh, and also, yeah, if it's possible, I will ask you uh, <laughs> the first question. Yeah, please do. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned um, different relations of, of Jordan and Oman with Israel and Iran. Mm. But uh, in this region, there also is Turkey. Yes. That is transferring somehow from uh, Republic to Islamic uh, with Mr. Erdogan. So what is the reaction to Erdogan's politics uh, from perspective of Jordan and Oman? Well, I think that um, you know, Erdogan himself, uh, he wants to be seen as a great Turkish leader. Uh, it's one of the reasons he's going abroad and, and all these adventures. I don't think the monarchies particularly like it, but they also, they will look at it from the perspective of what does it mean for Erdogan internally? And I think that for Erdogan, you know, as someone who campaigns on religious rhetoric and on making Turkey great again, uh, he is facing, Erdogan himself is facing uh, a sliding leader. He's facing uh, a lack of popularity to an extent. So the idea of Turkey expanding their influence in the Middle East is one that is understandable, partly as an economic distraction, but also because Turkey is going to want to get more and more involved. I think Erdogan sees himself as leading a Turkey that should lead the Middle East. And this has led to clashes with some of the monarchies um, because they do see Turkey as a potential threat. Uh, Turkey has an Ottoman history and Erdogan knows this and he draws on it. 
uh, he draws on it heavily in some cases. So the Sunni monarchies, I think that they don't necessarily like what Turkey is doing, but it depends also on the, the kind of alliances they want to forge and the interests they want to forge. Because Qatar is also a monarchy, yet they work with Turkey and they work with Iran. So one of the things that I'm exploring is to what extent would the Gulf Cooperation Council actually become divided if you have members who on the one hand are blockading Qatar and against Iran and Turkey, and then you have one or two members who are neutral or willing to work with Turkey, we may see a divided GCC. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Guys, your questions? Uh, probably, uh, yeah. And also, yeah, during your speech, I, I had uh, the second question uh, sure. concerning Qatar now. Yeah, like uh, due to some specific issues, yep. Saudi Arabia and other uh, Gulf countries and also uh, many countries just sanctioned uh, Qatar, uh, blaming it for terrorism assisting um, this region. So uh, do Amman and Jordan somehow uh, accept these sanctions and what are their relations to, to Qatar now? Uh that's a very excellent question because Jordan has, you know, as a, as a non-oil state, they have to be careful whose side they take. They may try to be neutral, but ironically, the blockade of Qatar by Saudi Arabia and a few others coincided with Saudi Arabia not renewing aid to Jordan. And so what happened there was that now we actually see that uh, Jordan has uh, been willing to talk to Qatar and uh, I know that I think the king has visited uh, uh, Doha, the capital of Qatar. So they may actually be, they may not come out and say the blockade was wrong, but they may be willing to keep uh, a healthy relationship with the Saudis while reaching out to Qatar for potential aid. Now Qatar is actually, and this is one of the reasons Saudi Arabia is so angry, Qatar is a very small country with a very small populace and a lot of oil and gas, a lot of gas especially. Now, though what that means is that they can afford to punch above their weight. They can afford to, to finance various projects uh, and still look after their populace from cradle to grave because it's so small. I mean, if you, if you look at the number of people living in Qatar, I think it's 2.7 million. That includes all the expats, everybody. Uh, if, you, if you look at only the people with the Qatari passport, I think it's only a few hundred thousand. So, you know, they have a much different demographic than Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, Amir Thani, he's quite young. He's still in his 30s. And he is, unlike Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, he is not seen as a reckless individual or impulsive. So I think more states on the world stage are willing to deal with Qatar. Uh, on top of that, I would say that uh, after Saudi Arabia um, got caught up in the, 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 the scandal of, of the murder of the Saudi journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, that also affected how some states will perceive Saudi Arabia and how they will deal with them publicly as well. Qatar does not have that problem. Uh, I also add that the, the issue of terrorism uh, a lot of the states who are accusing Qatar of interference through terrorism, um, Qatar has hit back at those comments by saying, well, these countries do not have the best human rights record. Saudi Arabia is, is very active in Yemen, for example. So they would probably strike back and, and focus on that as well. That also leads people to ask to what extent the blockade was actually um, based on real demands versus politically motivated. And I also know that there are people who I, colleagues who I work with, who work in Saudi Arabia, but who hold research positions in Qatar. And, you know, it's not a problem for them to go back and forth. No. Yeah. Uh, do you see chat? Uh, is it better to read for you? or, or I, I, I mean, could, Oh, yes. Uh, let's have a look here. I, I think I can go to chat. Uh, one moment. Uh, yep, it should uh, it should be coming up, shouldn't it? Or do you, or if you want, you can read them out. That be it might be easier. Yeah, I mean, what's the probability of the GCC collapse and creation of a new alliance with the U.S. support? That depends on a variety of factors. Uh, firstly, the, I don't think the GCC will, will, will fully collapse simply because it's been around since 1981. Uh, it was created in response to the Islamic revolution in Iran, and it still exists as a forum that is, is useful for members to meet, even if they don't agree. However, regarding how the US can swing that, let's wait till, 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 to see whether Biden or Trump wins. This is going to be a key point because if Trump does not win the election, 
I think that certain countries, especially Saudi Arabia, are going to feel that they are losing a key backer. Um, Biden, as a Democrat and as someone who is now, I think, leading, last time I checked uh, in the polls, he is someone who would not take Trump's stance. He's not going to be best friends with Saudi. He considers that they are necessary in the region. They are a strategic ally, but I don't think he will back them as strongly as Trump has. And that could lead to a shift in how Saudi Arabia behaves, which may also affect uh, GCC relations. For example, uh, when the blockade happened, the rumor is it happened because Trump gave his blessing. Okay, so be that the case, what if Biden's elected and he pushes for the blockade to end? You know, that may, that may be in, an interesting point. That could affect GCC relations and mean that Saudi Arabia is being told you have to stop being so aggressive. And that could actually mean that the GCC itself is further preserved. So I think that we'll have to see what happens after elections. But it's going to be very interesting to see what the U.S. does. Let's also not forget that there are other actors now in the Middle East, uh, such as China, who also want to get involved. Uh, and what China is doing is that they are entering a lot of partnerships and trade agreements across the Gulf. Uh, um, I know that from my from my own work that uh, now in the UAE they teach Mandarin or Chinese at universities. Um, so that tells me that they are also looking for other countries who are willing to partner with uh, the GCC. Yeah, thank you. Waiting for other questions. And also, yeah, yeah uh, I'm just curious, uh, what is the current relations uh, of Jordan and Oman with Russia now? Like, uh, yeah. yeah, some of our experts before uh, told us that it's better for Russia to cooperate with Iran uh, in the region than with others. But yeah, what do you think? Well, I think that uh, Iran is going to be careful in the sense that they want to balance their relationship between Iran and the rest of the world. Uh, that may become increasingly harder uh, because of COVID and because now, you know, they've their ratings have been downgraded two or three times now um, to the point where their bonds are now junk in Oman. So the idea of maintaining this neutrality may change uh, and they may look at other GCC states who are willing to offer aid and also get closer to, for example, Russia and other countries. Um, Jordan and Russia, I know that they have certain relations, uh, which I think are, are growing, at least last time I, I checked. Uh, Russia is, if I may, they are also another country that's interested in, in the Gulf and in the Middle East as well. And I think that a lot of the countries in the Gulf are willing to, to talk to Russia uh, as well. Yeah, thank you. So I guess uh, are there are no other questions. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Mr. Gunderson. Thank you very much for hosting me. I really appreciate your, your willingness to help us and to share your vision on uh, these interesting topics. Yeah, and yeah, uh, we hope to cooperate uh, in further, further times. Yeah, yeah definitely. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you for hosting.